In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. The next chapter of Sahih Muslim addresses uh, Kitab al Jihad, which is the book of uh, 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 Jihad, which refers to struggle and also expedition. It refers to struggling in the way of Allah spiritually as well as through expeditions. And let me explain. Um, the word jihad and I kind of like some of what Imam Muslim put uh, in his introductory as part of the meaning of jihad the word jihad uh, refers it means to exert yourself it means to struggle that's the meaning of this Arabic term it means to struggle or to strive and as Muslims we strive every day spiritually to try to keep ourselves in sync with the law's commands. Okay. And also in uh, Islam, you can strive physically too. And when we strive physically, that's when it be, that's during expeditions or if we're fighting, you know, because as Muslims, we are fighting spiritually every day against our desires we are fighting against our evils the our personal desires and evils every day for example you may be a person who is struggling every day to not give in to fornication you're struggling every day to not give in to alcohol to not give in to drugs you're struggling every day to not get caught up in racism and all of that crap that tribalism okay that's personal jihad that's your personal struggle but also there may come a time when we as Muslims have to also struggle collectively because society is faced with evils. Whenever society becomes faced with evils that impact all of us who are living within that society, then that's when you may have to become involved in a struggle uh, uh, collectively, which will take on the form as fighting during war. Okay. Allah speaks about this in the Quran when he says permitted are those who fought against because they have been oppressed. In other words, whenever your society has become overcome and oppressed, when you are not allowed to uh, uh, live your life without being violated by others, that's when you may have to go out and fight in a war. Okay, for example, say here in America, say America was bombed. Somebody is, uh, another country is dropping bombs on America. You have to protect the people here. You have to protect the citizens here. So our country may declare war and fight against that other country to keep them from impelling on the rights of others. That's a war. Okay, and there may come a time where we have to fight. But in Islam, Allah laid down the rules. Allah laid down the laws in regards to having to fight too. Everything in Islam has to be done with dignity. Everything in Islam has to be done justly. But we cannot violate certain rights, certain sanctities. And that's what we're going to go over today, the rights and sanctities that have to be honored in when we are fighting a civil war, okay? For example, if a civil war is needed, then we as Muslims have to appoint leaders and the leaders are appointed by the imam now i want you guys to understand we don't have uh these hadiths are speaking in regards to a caliphate we do not have a caliphate and we will not have a caliphate until the Mahdi comes after the prophet muhammad died abu Bakr took over as the caliphate and they continued to fight against the romans and the persians the Romans had decided that the Arabic people were becoming too advantageous. So they had declared war on them. 
Abu Bakr became the leader over the Muslims and he had to engage in war with the Romans. After the death of Abu Bakr, Umar took over as the caliph and he, that the Romans had been defeated, but he now had to fight against the Persians because the Persians had declared war. Okay, right now as Muslims, we do not have a caliphate. You know, the Muslims are not fighting to try to spread Islam throughout the country. None of that is going on now. But when the Mahdi comes, he will be the caliphate over the Muslims. And there are certain uh, rules that have to be adhered to. Okay, and our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, laid down the rules of etiquette that has to be honored. And he gave these rules right before he died because he knew that Abu Bakr would have to take over as the leader. He'd have to fight against the Romans who had declared war against the Muslims at that time. And let's look to see what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his people before he died. Okay, one of the companions tells us that when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would appoint someone as a leader of an army or a detachment. He would always tell them to fear Allah and to be good to the people who were with him. He would tell his, his, his leaders that he appointed to fight in the name of Allah and also fight the way Allah commanded us to. Do not embezzle the spoils of war. Do not break your promises. Do not mutilate dead bodies. This is a crime in Islam. And I want you guys to understand that as Muslims, we are forbidden to mutilate dead bodies. Look at what these terrorists are doing today. They're mutilating dead bodies all over the place. And by the way, if you do not adhere to the rules of combat, that Allah has set aside for us, then you are not fighting in the name of Allah. To fight in the name of Allah means you honor the rules of war that Allah has set in effect. And one of those rules is you cannot mutilate the dead. If they're mutilating the dead, then you are not fighting in the way of Allah. You're fighting for yourself. Also, the prophet said, do not kill children. Allah does not allow for us to go around killing children. And also, you don't just go around killing people because they're non-Muslim either. The prophet said, when you meet your enemies who are polytheists, invite them to three courses of action. And if they respond to one of these things, then you accept their response and don't do them any harm. He said, you invite them to Islam. If they accept it, then you don't fight them anymore. Or you can invite them to, to migrate from their lands to another land and tell them if they do that, then they shall have all the privileges and obligations of a person who migrates. Again, none of this is happening today. Well, first of all, we're not engaged in no so-called Islamic war today. There's no need for it today. It's not happening today. It's not going to happen until the Mahdi comes. He's going to come when it's already happening. There is no war going on throughout the entire world against Islam right now. It may be in the beginning stages of happening, but it's not happening yet. We're allowed to live and practice our religion freely in different parts of the world. Okay? But the prophet is saying back in his days, they weren't allowed. Remember, the prophet was fighting against his fellow Arabs. Just so you guys know, who was the prophet Muhammad fighting against? His fellow Arabs who were trying to prevent him from practicing his religion. Okay, these hospitable Arabs. Then they were his own relatives. These were his uncles and his relatives that he was fighting, was fighting against because they did not want them to live and practice Islam. Okay. So anyway, he goes on to say that when you come upon the polytheists, you can invite them to Islam. If they refuse, then ask them to migrate and tell them if they do migrate, they'll have the same uh, privileges and obligations of any other person who migrates. 
or they can stay where they are but be and be subjected to the commands of a law okay so these are some of the rules uh that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set in place when he and his companions were fighting against the Quraysh and all the other Arabs who were trying to stand in the way of them practicing their religion. And also he said for those who, who remain and agree to stop fighting against you and they are non-Muslim, then they pay the jizya tax. This is a tax that the non-Muslims pay to live in the Muslim land. Okay. When the Mahdi comes, Jesus will come after him. And we talked about that in the previous class. When Jesus comes, Jesus will come and be the lead, become the leader of the world. He will defeat the Antichrist and Jesus will do away with the Jizya tax. Why? because the whole world at that time will embrace Islam. That means everyone living on earth at that time will become Muslim and there will be no need for a jizya attack. But here, these are some of the rules and etiquettes that our prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam set in effect, okay? And also, Allah commands that when you're fighting to show leniency, and to avoid creating aversion towards your religion. In other words, making people hate you because you're Muslim. In Islam, we don't go around making people hate us because we're barbaric. We have to show kindness to people, leniency to people, make people want to be like you, not make people fear you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to tell his, his, his men before he sent them out on an expedition, he would say, give good news to the people and do not create in their minds hatred towards our religion. Show them leniency, show them kindness, and don't be hard on them. And this is one of the things that our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us that the Christians have over us. The Christians, they take care of their weak and their poor. The Christians, they do not allow their leaders to oppress and overpower them. And they do have that leniency that they show like in this picture here that's why i took this picture here's a picture of what's going on in overseas in syria or something this is a united states officer walking with two little children muslim kids you know when they take these type of pictures why do you think the journalists do that why do you think the journalists take pictures like this to show the compassion that the soldiers have so you, it creates in your heart no aversion against them, no hatred against them. When you look at CNN News and you see a picture like this of an American soldier walking with two children, it makes you say, oh, they must be good people. It makes you not hate them. This is what the prophet said. When you go on a, a, an expedition, don't create hatred towards our religion by, by being mean to the people. He said, show leniency to them. Don't be hard on them. Give them good words, good news. Do not create hatred. Work with them. Don't be divided. And that's why nowadays, when you look at the news, they'll take, you'll see a lot of pictures like this because the press is trying to put in the minds because nobody likes war. You don't like sending your children out to battle. You don't like your family being out there fighting a battle. So they'll put pictures like this out there so you can see we're being compassionate. We're being, we're being lenient. We're not making the people hate us. This picture makes you think, oh, the American soldiers working, they're understanding the religion here and they're working to try to help the people here. This is what we're supposed to be doing as Muslims. The prophet said, Shh, give solace and show leniency. Don't make 
a version and that's what this this soldier is showing in that picture okay also another rule of battle Islam has a great hatred towards traitors you're not supposed to betray your people the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when Allah gathers the people together on the day of judgment, all the early and late generations of mankind will stand together and a flag will be raised to show every person who was a traitor of faith. And that person's name will be announced and he will be called a traitor of his faith. And he will stand before that flag. So Islam, you know, you're not supposed to betray your people, betray your religion, betray your faith. For those people who were traitors, they will stand before the other people with a flag signifying that they were traitors on the day of judgment. Okay. Also, the prophet said there is no guilt of, tre of treachery more serious than the one committed by the ruler of a man. Now that's a powerful hadith there. If you are the ruler or the leader, and if you betray your people, that's even a more horrific sin. Okay, so becoming a traitor or betraying your people, this is something that Allah will not tolerate on the day of judgment. So if you're going to go out and fight in a battle, you have to, first of all, you know, there is, you know, you're not forcing Islam on anyone. You can give them the choice, either become Muslim or you can live here and pay the jizya tax or you can migrate. Okay. And then if you do uh, overcome the people there, you show compassion, show leniency, be nice and kind to the people. Don't make them hate us. Don't make them fear us and hate us. Okay, and don't betray Allah. Don't betray the people. Don't betray your faith. And also show patience. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, do not want to fight. But if you have to fight, be firm and show patience. Again, fighting is the last resort. Whenever the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam engaged in battle, he didn't just run out there fighting. He would first meet with the leaders to try to negotiate some type of peace agreement. He said, do not desire to, to fight. Instead, try to negotiate some type of peaceful ending. And that's the same thing that Abu Bakr did. That's the same thing Umar did. That's the same thing Uthman did, Ali. When Ali fought against Aisha, remember, he didn't want to fight her. They went into negotiations to try to resolve the differences. Whenever Umar fought against the Persians, before he fought against them, he met with the, with the Persian ruler and tried to negotiate a settlement with them. So before fighting, Islam teaches to try to negotiate a peaceful means. Fighting is only a last resort. And, if, and we have to show patience during the encounter. Okay, so this is something too uh, that we have to remember. This is another rule of battle. You know, don't wish to want to go out and fight. Instead, try to seek peace with the enemy first. Try to come to some type of resolution with the enemy first. That's what the Prophet did. That's what Abu Bakr did, Umar, uh, Uthman, Ali, and all of them. Okay? And also, if you have to fight, Islam encourages to pray to Allah for victory. And again, do not kill the women and children. We do not kill women and children in Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cursed the tribes who had marched in Medina. He said, Oh Allah, the revealer of the book, take account against these tribes that are coming here to fight us. He made dua asking Allah to give them victory, to protect them from the Arabs that had come into Medina to try to kill them. So that's an example of how you should call upon Allah for victory. Ask Allah to protect you. 
even on the day, the, the day of the battle of Uhud, the prophet said, Oh Allah, please do not allow us Muslims to be defeated because if we are defeated, there will be no one here on earth to worship you. Every battle the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fought, he called upon Allah first to protect them and to help them. The same with Abu Bakr, the same with Umar, Uthman, Ali. Every battle they fought, before they fought, they asked for Allah to give them victory. Okay? And also, a woman was found killed in one of the battles fought by the prophet. And when he saw that woman dead, he became angry. He said, there is no killing of women and children. He said, I forbid the killing of women and children because one of the people had went out there and killed a woman. And the woman, the prophet was so angry because one of his men had killed a woman. The woman was trying to protect her husband and her family and this woman ended up killed as a result. The prophet said, no, this is wrong. No killing of women and no killing of children. So this is another rule of combat. No killing of women and children. No forcing Islam on people. No mutilating bodies. No embezzling of the spoils of war. These are some of the rules of law set in effect. And again, the spoils of war was made lawful for us as Muslims. The spoils of war occurs when you have become victorious. If you have defeated the people of the land, Islam allows us to take in the, the spoils of the war. This is, was always the case with other people too. When the, the, the English people fought, Irish people fought, you always, you know, you won vic the victory, you would get the spoils of war. Well, Islam allows us to have the spoils of war too. In fact, this is one of the, we are the only people that were granted this. The Jews were not granted that. Neither were the Christians. When they fought their battles, they were not entitled to the spoils of war. But in Islam, with the event of Islam, Allah allowed us Muslims to take in the spoils of war. Okay? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the spoils of war were not made lawful for the Christian or Jews. The reason why Allah made it lawful for us is because Allah saw our weakness and humility. So that's why Allah made it lawful for the Muslims because the, the, the Muslims displayed humility when it came to fighting. They did then. Do they show humility today? That's very, very questionable. Okay? So these are some of the rules set in effect. And I want you guys to remember, okay? No mutilating bodies. No killing of women and children. No forcing Islam upon the people. You give them the right to migrate. You give them the right to stay there and pay the jizya tax. Also, fighting should be a last resort. You should try to resolve it through negotiations. You should try to resolve your conflicts peacefully. Also, show patience with the people. Be nice with the people. If you do overcome and, and, and become uh, the victorious in a battle, don't make the people hate you. Don't make the people fear you and hate you and hate your religion. Show kindness to them, compassion towards them, to make them uh, honor you and, and maybe want to convert to your religion because they see the compassion like this picture here. They would make you want, that would make you want, make them want to convert to your way of life or make them inquisitive as to your way of life because of the compassion that you're showing them, the goodness you're giving them, the leniency you're exposing them to. Give solace. Do not create aversion. This is a great command to be honored during war times. Okay, so we're gonna stop right here for today. Tomorrow we're gonna continue with the next chapter of Hadith that address the spoils of war. 
We're going to go into more detail about the spoils of war tomorrow and a little bit more of the rules that Allah has set in, a, in place uh, for us as Muslims to observe if we find ourselves uh, fighting in a war. So we'll stop right here. If you guys have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them on the screen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shadon la ilaha